morning. Uh, people who work with me and who've known me for a long time know that I frequently tell stories about my mother. Um, she is a lifelong and very devout Catholic, and she is a total piece of work. So I was talking to her the other day. She's uh, doing a little rehab in a facility in Wilkes-Barre near King's, and uh, she's not enjoying, but so I, she said to me, and she always calls me honey, so she said, honey, um, you know, you got your big talk down there in Texas. And I said, yes, I do. And she said, are you nervous? And I said, I said, Mother, I speak before hundreds of people every Sunday. And she quickly said, yeah, but these people might listen. <laughs> no matter how devout she is, she is my mother. And I am not really a priest in her mind, except uh, She's very proud of all of us, so I just wanted to make sure you meant, I mentioned my mother this morning. Donald uh, gave a little summary of my life, and you know, for those of us in religious life, uh, when you die, they produce a little card, and you never want it to be more than one card, because it looks like you've just been moved around all of your life, and you've been, in, you know, not stable. So I appreciate uh, Donald's comments, but I am only 46 years old, so all of those things were done in the last few years, and they were in influential certainly in, in my life. But I, I want to tell you just briefly about my family background because it really influences my passion for what we're about here today. I was raised by a Catholic mother and a Methodist father. He was Methodist for the first 40 years of my parents' 54-year marriage. Uh, he died a few years ago. And when my father and mother married, of course, back in those days, you had to sign that you would raise your children actively as Catholics. You had to sign, as a Methodist, you had to sign that your child, that you, not your Catholic spouse, but that you were going to raise your children as a Catholic. So my father was a simple guy, not that well educated, quite frankly, and he signed that, and, and he had that so important, that Protestant work ethic, which thankfully I think he gave to his children as well. And he believed, well, I have to do this, so how do I do it? I can't do it myself. I don't know anything about Catholicism other than that I love a Catholic. So he looked around and the answer was obvious. There are these Catholic schools. And so he paid for our Catholic education. He insisted we attend Catholic schools and he worked two jobs to do that. The second job being a janitor in the very Catholic grade school that I attended. So much has been given for me to get to this point. And certainly then when I went to King's and fell in love with the congregation of Holy Cross, uh, the rest is history, and it's been a great history for me. So I, I want to start this talk out, and I need to find my little clicker. I want to start by thanking people, and I want to thank all of you, and I'll do that after I do some general introductions. I want to thank certainly Dr. Martin and Sister Donna. Sister Donna herself was part of this work uh, for my dissertation, and certainly Dr. Martin has been crucial in bringing the Institute here and in continuing to be a steward of this fine Holy Cross institution. I certainly am pleased that Father General is here. Uh, Father Warner is incredibly supportive to Holy Cross institutions and to education. And Brother Tom Zegan, who uh, said to me last night that I must mention him this morning. Um, but Tom has been a dear friend since we found ourselves living together at Morrow Seminary many years ago, and certainly has been instrumental not only in my personal life as a religious and as an individual, but in this study and in my work in education. And uh, Tom gave a little part of a talk last year that was so inspirational to me about Holy Cross education around the world. And I want to say as an introductory comment to my study that we're going to talk about today, that the study was focused on 14 of our high schools in the United States. Um, Cathedral, which happily has rejoined us, was uh, very helpful to me, and I'll mention that later. But, but I want to be clear that the, that the people in the room who are from our international community, that, that what I'm saying today literally can not only be translated in English to whatever language of your country, but it, it certainly, I think, uh, it's the charism of the congregation. So therefore, it, it transfers to any culture in which we're talking about, and I think you'll see that and you'll agree with me. Um, as I, I said, I am the president of Holy Cross High School, and I'm enormously proud of that. I think this is when we're at our best. And I bet you, you're sitting there thinking that it's when you're all at your best. This was the Mass of the Holy Spirit this year for the high school. Brother Francis Leary, who is a dear a member of the Moral Province and of, of the high school community, says they're, they're unbelievable at Mass. 
But I know that every educator in this room can say the same thing about your school. That is when we're at our best, when we are ultimately doing what Basil Moro wanted us to do, and that was to be ultimately a Christian community and a family. My uh, dissertation was dedicated to my parents, of course, but we can't not recognize today the great gift that these schools are to the world, to the church, and we have to recognize the dedication of our brothers. At some point in the history of our American community, it was decided that the brothers would focus on secondary education, and, and that was a moment of grace I don't think that we can ever not recognize. These schools are a tremendous gift to us. I want to thank every teacher, every campus minister who brings about the vision of Father Moreau in our schools. And I want to talk about leadership, because that's who everyone in this room is. You wouldn't have been invited here by your, your own administrators if you weren't seen as a leader in our schools, and certainly our presidents and our principals and our campus ministers. I want to take just a, just a moment to thank someone who has been so instrumental in Holy Cross High School, who's making a transition for us, uh, Joe Gianuzzi. This is the greatest picture Joe Gianuzzi ever taken. Look at that. Joe has been our principal for many years, and uh, Joe has just graciously accepted my offer to make him vice president for mission. This picture was taken, I think, at my installation mass. And um, now I'm not, I don't want to say anything disparaging to any ethnic group in Queens, New York. But if this does not look like a scene from The Sopranos, <laughs> those are two of our board members behind him that look like the, um, the bodyguards. And look at poor brother David Trammell, terrified. <laughs> Has no idea what to do next. So I want to publicly thank Joe for his ministry as principal. He's not leaving the high school, he's moving into another ministry, but, but uh, Joe has been crucial to Holy Cross. And he is a Holy Cross man himself. He's a graduate and a devout member of the, the Holy Cross family. I want to make a transition from Dr. Martin's talk from last year, which I was inspired by, and did a little follow-up reading. George, I, I mean, how many of people will say that about any of our talks? So that was, that was pretty good. I want to talk about uh, these, cult, these textured vocabularies of hope. I thought that was a spectacular phrase. And Dr. Martin was talking about it in the context of strategic planning, but ultimately I think he was talking about it as well in the context of leading and being a leader, a textured vocabulary of hope. The author uh, and the, the, the researcher behind those theories um, was writing in a secular context, but I mean it is so, in my mind, Catholic. It's such a beautiful Catholic worldview and a way of looking at organizational management and leadership, a textured narrative of hope. And that's what we're really about today in my mind. So when Doctor was talking about it as an expression of hope, as an expression of planning, he, he certainly connected it to that, that, that part of us that the congregation brings to us about hope. And what a, what a necessary virtue for not only what we do, but for the way we live our lives today in a very challenging world that's growing and changing and frightful at times. And as we lead young people, I mean, when I think about the kids that I do get in my office, and certainly my role is not as directly connected to the kids, but as you're talking to them, you think what they, they need most is that transmission of a sense of hope, of Certainly, we've got a message that will give them hope, and that's the Christian message. But, but how important is it that we lead in that sense of hope? And so I, wanna, I wanted to build a little bridge between what Dr. said last year and what we hope to do today. And, you know, ultimately, I'm presenting my dissertation. Now, I, I wasn't going to say that in the opening sentence because that sounds just desperately boring. How many people here have done a dissertation? A handful of you. I mean, who in God's name really wants to talk about your dissertation? Right? I mean, there is a way that it's a passion in your life, right? But I mean, it's not that translatable to the passions of other people's lives. 
But because my dissertation was a study of our schools, it is translatable to your lives and to what you do. So uh, I, but I didn't want to make it just that. I wanted to wrap it into a few other little things. And uh, when Brother Donald asked me to do this, it was very clear that we wanted this to be uh, an institute gathering that was a transition. I think we've done some beautiful work on laying the foundation of who we are and our heritage, which is uniquely important to the congregation of Holy Cross in our schools. Because our heritage, in, in a way, was disconnected from our founder. There are members of the congregation of Holy Cross in this room who went through formation when the founder was never mentioned. Or we knew his name, but we knew nothing about him. I was just with our brothers in Indiana. We were at Notre Dame for a few days. Brother Francis Leary, we took him out to see the old novitiate in Rolling Prairie. And as we were talking, he said, I, I don't think in that year that I was here, I heard the name Moreau more than once. That started to change in my formation 25 years ago. And it's certainly very different today. And some of you younger people in our schools are saying that makes no sense. I certainly have known about this, yes, but, but we did not. And, and so this transition from laying the foundations of our heritage to getting our schools in a way up to speed with that has happened through this institute. And it has happened, and I, I will say this boldly, that our brothers took this seriously many years, quite frankly, in a way, before the priests in our community did, in our institutions. And they led the way for us. And, and we'll see that, I think, today in my presentation. So this talk is a transition into, all right, so we know all of that, we know the history, we know the heritage. Where is it really at in our schools? That's what the characteristics are, is kind of a measure of who we are relative to the, the founding charism. And, and where do we go next? And where we go next is really the next guy's job for next year, but mine is a transition to see where we're at at this moment. But of course, being who I am, I'm gonna tell you where we should go at the end. You know, I, I really do believe that leaders are purveyors of hope. Everybody in this room. You know, I have the advantage of going into an institution new in the last two years. And, uh, you know, you come in with, with, I come in with a heritage and I come in with the realities of me being a Holy Cross priest. But I come into an institution with no alliances, with no allegiances, with no, you know, histories. And so I look at it as objectively as humanity can. And I think at that moment, though, people were expecting me to say something hopeful. This is where we're going. This is who we are and what we're going to do. This is how it's been great, and this is how it's going to be greater. But each of you do that. Each of you do that in your own way, in your ministry within a school. This, uh, this photograph, to me, sums up some important things for what I want to say about leadership. That little old man on the right, in my mind, did the boldest thing in leadership in a generation. He got out of the way. And there is a, there's an art to that. I could give a whole presentation on knowing when it's time to go. And everybody in this room knows that they've experienced people who don't know when it's time to go. He did, but he had to shift an entire expectation of an institution to do it, and he did it. And then the man on the other side has started doing these little things that just fascinate the American media. And he's talking about it, and everywhere you go, they're talking about these little things. But, you know, he paid his hotel bill. I mean, when you think about it, who cares? But there was in that simple living of his life, and I, I don't believe that he's getting up in the morning and saying, what's, a, you know, what's CBS going to cover today? So let me do that. I think he's just living his life as you all do every day. But, but what leadership those little things are providing us. And, and I want to reinforce, and I, I, this is the homily part of this talk, by the way, that, that what you do is purvey hope. And, and sometimes it's in small actions, living out that vision that, that the founder has given us. And I, you know, I, just like Jesus, wouldn't you have liked to known Moreau? I mean, we have that awful... Uh, one image of him that makes him look like he's mean. Now we've, we've thankfully have, have gotten better artistic images 
which I think expressed probably the personality that he had. Why would we all still be following a man that was so dour? We're following a man that I think had to be incredibly charismatic when you were in his presence and lived his life in such a way that other people wanted to follow. We, we wouldn't be here today, I think, if that's not the case. Ultimately, what I want us to do by the end of this, and, and as we go back to our ministries, is really live, to, to borrow some of Dr. Martin's talk last year, to live what I believe is a textured narrative of hope. Hope is found not only, obviously, for us in Jesus Christ and in the resurrection, but in our tradition as Holy Cross educators. And the texture of that narrative is the lives of the students before us and of those individual institutions. Decades ago now, I heard a talk by our then provincial, Father David Farrell, who was a Latin American, is still a missionary in Latin America. And David's a bit nuts, there's no doubt about it. Um, but he was incredibly charismatic, and still is, and could get you charged up. Even about stuff that you viciously disagreed with him about, he excited you. And he talked about placing the content of the church in the context in which we live. And that was a moment that changed my understanding of the church and of what we'd be. I, you know, I grew up in Binghamton, New York. What did I know about the church in Brazil? Or what did I know about our, our community in Africa? Well, but if we take the content of the church, which I believe is hope, ultimately, and we place it in our context, that's how our lives and the texture develops that's unique to us while remaining Catholic and Holy Cross. And so by the end of this, that's what I'm hoping to achieve, that we go back and we live that textured narrative of hope in our own context, but closer in our bond together as Holy Cross educators. There's just nothing more true than that statement. So I'm not going to even go on about that slide. Just read it quickly, and I'm going to move right on, because you already know that what you do every day is bring Christian hope to one another and to the students that we teach and the people that we love. I just threw that in there to distract you for a minute. Um, we were just given that statue by a, a benefactor who is also giving us a statue of Brother Andre. It's in front of the school. Um, it changes, I think the Holy Cross crowd would agree. It changed the whole front of the school. You know, our school is, a, as we call it, a brother's box. It's a rectangle, cinder blocks. Um, but that, it, something just changed the minute she went in. Um, and it's Seat of Wisdom, Sede Sapienzi, the, the donor's uh, foundation, he's rather wealthy, is uh, named for his grandmother, who he's very, uh, very devoted to. And uh, he wanted something to reflect, obviously, the love of God, and, but that relationship between a son and his mother. And if you don't know, we're an all-boys school. So he wanted them to see that every day as they came in. And uh, it really has just changed the, the, the face of the school in many ways. Every one of you, and I, I don't say this because we have a new pope and it seems to be the thing to say, but your lives are a ministry. It, it, this isn't... Yeah, we have to pay you. And I resent that at times, by the way, that we have to pay you. But that was a joke. But your lives are a ministry. I mean, you're, nobody's getting rich over this. Nobody's, uh, you know, uh, you don't come to work every day because you can't do anything else. This is a ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and really what keeps you passionate about it is everything that's written behind me. That you yourselves have experienced the Christian mystery. And you're a witness to that, and witnesses have to tell it. And so we tell it within the Catholic tradition and the Holy Cross tradition, which are, are not dissimilar things in the least, they're the same thing. But we tell it because we've experienced it ourselves. And I want to place this entire thing, the entire study was placed in the context of your ministries. So those of you who participate in the actual taking of the survey, I mean, the language and everything about it was, was to to continue to build up that idea that what we do in common is a ministry in the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of the congregation of Holy Cross. My favorite line from the Constitutions, and how appropriate as we just continue the Easter celebration, we know, we've seen, you've seen, if you've been a teacher for more than 10 seconds, 
You've seen the resurrection, which was such an image for Moreau relative to what we are about as education. Education is an act of resurrection. Well, you know it. You've seen it. You've had that kid that's changed right before you. You've had that colleague, quite frankly, that's done the same. You yourself have done the same if you've been involved in education for a day. You're different than you were before. And hopefully, you're different in that sense of joy. Not, I'm not saying every moment is a joy. I'm not setting that. It's, of course it's not. This is hard work. But you know it. And you long for those stories to build in your life, like our older brothers tell. You know, I, I live with some men who have been in education for, I mean, Brother Joseph Zutel has probably taught for at least 50 years. He's going to be 91. I live with other men that have led our schools. And what, what are the stories that they tell that reflect that longing for the light of Easter, but the stories of the kids that, that were transformed by us in what we do and in our schools? And since the very beginning, it hasn't been just the brothers and the priests or the sisters. It's been lay people like yourselves that have been longing for that light with us. I, I just want to tell a brief uh, story about an experience in my dissertation process, and it's about Moro Catholic, and I didn't, I didn't tell Terry I was going to say this, but I did a little pilot study, um, and it was part of a course that I was taking at USF. Terry was great about giving me access to the school, and um, I've been there to say Mass. It's, it's a great place, just like all of our schools are. But. So I went there and I did a series of interviews uh, with students focusing primarily on their retreat program, and these were kids involved in campus ministry. And, you know, Moral Catholic has not had a, a religious presence uh, on the property full-time probably in over 20 years at this point. But I have to say, I find it one of the most Holy Cross schools I've ever been in anywhere. Um, the kids speak a language that, that's, that's our language. And in those interviews, um, they kept talking about being Holy Cross. Now, for that, up to that point in my life, I thought, well, I'm Holy Cross. You know, I, I did the novitiate, and I took vows. Look at all that I've given up for this. I'm Holy Cross. But as I was listening to those kids, it was the first time, and it was like a little switch, and this might make me sound like a total idiot. A switch went off in me, and I thought, my God, they buy this. Like, this, this is their lives. This isn't just my life, or the priest's lives, or the brother's lives, or the sister's lives. This is their life. And again, to go back to compliment the brothers, it was their vision that we're going to unfold a little bit in a few minutes that, that allowed that to happen. And to me, that is what Moreau wanted. He didn't just want it to be the professed religious. I think his vision was larger than that, and I think those kids at Moreau Catholic got it. They got it, and they taught me about it, which it was, it was an incredible experience. So these are, what, these are the things I want to do today. To build that bridge and to move into uh, to talking about my actual research, which I did really now three years ago, and you all helped me with that. Certainly celebrating the heritage we've already recognized with the brothers, and then considering some things that I think we need to look at for our future, particularly as a group of people. So, just, now here's the really boring part, just warning you. But I'm not going to go over each little thing here. I just wanted to give you a sense of what my dissertation was about and how it, it, it built so that I came up with the work that, in the end, we're going to talk about today. So that's just, those of you that have done a dissertation, you already know that. So, you start out with a problem when you're doing research. And, and I'd like to say a question, but, but really they call it a problem. So, so the problem is this, what do we do with these schools? This is a conversation that happens in our dinner tables constantly as priests and brothers in the congregation. Um, and it started a long time ago, but we're still having it. There, we're worried in a little way. There's a little anxiety, and, and I don't mean that in any way to disparage the fact that we trust the rest of the people in this room, but we love this charism that is the congregation, and we want to make sure it continues so how do we do that? So that was the bottom line of my research question. You know, and, and let's face it, there just aren't enough of us anymore. 
Uh, the house I live in once had 40 brothers on the top floor of that high school. In 1980, it was cut in half, the residence, half given to the school, the other half is still our residence. There are 11 brothers and myself there. Um, there are only two that are full-time in the building, an additional four that work part-time. They're just, they're just not, we just don't have the people that we once had. But, but there are enough of you, and I'm gonna go to the next slide, just to prove crudely the obvious. And because, you know, if you're those people that have done dissertations, you remember those little annoying things that you ended up having to do the last minute. You know, the dissertation chair said, you need a chart. So I went to the library in San Francisco on an uncommonly hot day in San Francisco and went through 20 years worth of Catholic directories to come up with these silly numbers. But it, it just shows the reality. At one point, though, there were almost 7,000 religious brothers in this country. In 1990, that's not that long ago. And now, slightly less, probably about 4,700. But the other number is even more important to us, how many taught and how many are teaching now. And, it, and it's an obvious decline. But there are 77.7 million Catholics in the world, 25% of the American population. And that, I just got that off the internet, which is always true. <laughs> you don't have to work that hard to get a doctorate, really. <laughs> it's slightly less than Wikipedia, but that... Um... So there's enough of you. There's enough of the rest of you to do this. So the, so the problem is already solved in a way, but, but then the question remains, how do we transmit that charism to, um, to all of you? So this is the great part of the story, and, and Brother Stephen Walsh of Late and Happy Memory, who was incredibly generous to me in this study, um, it was Stephen that walked me through this. And, and if any of the brothers that are listed there are in the room and the story is different, please don't tell it because this is the story I'm gonna tell right now. So after a chapter, you know, we could see what was gonna happen. We could see that we weren't getting big numbers. There weren't novice classes of 100 any longer. So literally, the way Stephen told the story, and I have this wonderful email from him about this, you know, they, they went to a cabin in the High Sierra on a snowy night with a legal pad and sat down. I suspect there was alcohol involved. Um, well, Bill Nick was there, so I... And, and they, they discussed their experience. Like, what is it? What are the characteristics of a Holy Cross school? And I'm not sure at the beginning of the conversation they even came up with that phrase, but, but they sat down and they wrote their experience out. But keep in mind, those brothers had not been formed in the way that all of you have been formed, to understand and to know and to have read Christian education. That was not part of our formation. They were literally just reflecting on their experience. Now, no offense to my California friends, but, but so I'm telling this story in California, and, and the crunchy granola crowd loved it, you know? I, like, they're, I, you have to give a little presentation, and they're like, wow, you know, so I was, I thought that this was just an idea I was having about the dissertation, but once they got that excited, this is what I was doing. So from that meeting, the characteristics came about. Um, and I, I'm gonna go over those in a second. But I wanna say this too about the characteristics. Um, that at the end of that meeting, Brother Stephen Walsh, I believe, was the one who said, you know, there's this thing out there, this thing that Father Moreau wrote called Christian education. And it's in French, but we should get it translated. That was in like 1983. So we had nothing, up to, most of us had nothing accessible of what the founder wrote, other than perhaps his circular letters in those bound editions in each novice's room, uh, which certainly was not handed out to the lay people. That, we never even had that until then. And yet our brothers came up with these characteristics. So there's gonna be a discussion in your own schools uh, groups later about them, but I, I wanna go over them uh, just quickly and then get into what you all said about these things in your schools. So a Holy Cross school exists to educate in the faith, to evangelize through religious instruction, campus ministry, and spiritual and moral guidance. And I know as we go through this, some of you are gonna say, well, Father, these are broad characteristics. Isn't this true in a Marist school or a De La Salle school? Well, perhaps, but I think that what makes it unique, 
and a charism for us is how they come together and how clearly you'll see in a minute they were in the mind of Father Moreau and somehow, I obviously believe through the Holy Spirit, were transmitted to our brothers when they sat down with that legal pad. Holy Cross School views itself as part of the local church and Holy Cross School serves a diverse population. How many people, now be honest with me, don't look to see what your president or your principal is going to do. How many of you have ever seen these or, or, or know any of these? Other than the old guard. <laughs> Derry. All right, good. Well, good. Good, so it's not boring at this point. It finds ways of providing opportunities for the poor. It's a community and a family. We love that one, don't we? Isn't that the first thing out of your mouth, right? Presidents, when they say, and they ask you what's unique about your school, we're a family, we're a community. We do that extraordinarily well, and we, we love that part of it. Uh, its mission includes the best education possible. Holy Cross School selects and retains teachers with great care. Seems obvious by the teachers I've met in this few days. Holy Cross School's mission includes helping students become active and informed citizens. I, I think our schools do that incredibly well at every level, from St. Edmund's Academy to St. Edward's University and all of the grades in between. A Holy Cross School's mission includes instilling each student with a strong sense of personal self-worth and feelings of accomplishment. Should I get Narod back in here to give that talk again from last night? Because that's what it was all about. I mean, and I, I'm, what an idiot I am for following that kid. I mean, it, he was desperately inspiring, and we never saw that talk before he gave it last night, but uh, I mean, number nine was his entire experience of our schools. Holy Cross School helps students to develop all aspects of their humanity, that holistic education that we all work so hard to achieve in our schools. A Holy Cross School provides an orderly learning environment, on some days more than others. And Holy Cross School provides efficient and well-maintained facilities, what, uh, what the president spends constant time on, walking around. I know the other principals and presidents in the room, and I'm sure it's true even in higher education. You notice everything. I mean, you got to go home once in a while because you walk around and you notice every light bulb that's not on. You, you notice everything. So facilities are important to us. I want you to keep in mind as we go through your responses and when you look back at the characteristics that our formation up to a certain point, probably as, as soon back as 25 years ago, we really didn't get that solid formation in what the founders said to us. So this is remarkable in my mind, that it was transmitted to our community, to our brothers and our priests, uh, seminarians and the novitiate, without ever being explicitly said. There's a whole study in education right there, and what we already know about pedagogy. But, um, it wasn't Christian education was not translated, so we didn't steal stuff from there in coming up with the characteristics. It was only afterwards that we translated that and then began to see how close these characteristics were to the vision of the founder. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about the fact that they are. If you have time to do a doctorate like I did, and you have time to actually finally read everything that the founder wrote as circular letters of Christian education, and then thanks to, to people like Brother Joel, who have spent decades studying the founder, um, a, a very fine talk given a few years ago here by Brother George Schmidt, who encapsulated so beautifully the historical context of Father Moreau, which was critical to his vision and to the development of his, uh, his vision. And, and how, in his lifetime, the world changed so much. And we, we, we can all too often think that this time in, our, in the history of the world is the only time that the world changes so much. He lived with 10 governments in his life. I mean, we, you know, the sequester. This man didn't know the next morning when he woke up well, who was going to be in charge of the country in which he was living. So it, it, desperately important to who he is as a visionary, visionary in education. So now, those of you that did dissertations too, you know you have to do those charts and the graphs and, the, and you spend more time actually doing that than you do writing, you know, getting the lines in order because your chair is going to go over all that nonsense. So I, I did do a content analysis looking at all of the writings of Moreau relative to each characteristic. So I'm going to put up a, a, 
a table that I did um, afterwards. At, I'd like you to, to, to congratulate me on that table. Not on the talk, but the table, because the table took longer than it did to write this talk. So on the left are, are quotes from his writings, and on the right is the individual characteristic that I just went over. And, and I'm not going to pain you to go through every one, but, but it's so connected. His writings, it's all about these things. And, you know, again, I think we have to place him in a historical context and what's unique about him at the moment and the things that he spoke about and wrote about and wanted of us that were revolutionary. I mean, we don't think of it that way. People in, were not doing these things in those days, including collaborating so closely with the laity. I mean, he was, he was a visionary. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Holy Cross priest, but I think historians would agree with me that, that his vision for what we were to be about in schools was unbelievably different than what he had experienced in a fractured and decimated education system in France at his time. So there are incredible correlations between what the brothers did on that legal pad and coming up with these characteristics and the actual vision and words of the founder. But they didn't do it with that information. They didn't do it with years of study or with lectures given by our, our, our leadership. They didn't. But somehow it was transmitted. And I think that's, that, to me, that made this entire project worthwhile. Because it, 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 it makes you pause and think, well, could you imagine that this is actually the work of the Holy Spirit? That our entire endeavor really is the work of the Holy Spirit. So it leads us to that content of who we are, our charism, a word that's been kicked around an awful lot since the Second Vatican Council. And, and just to save time here, a, a charism is a gift given to an individual or to a group through the actions of the Holy Spirit for the good of the church, to build up the body of Christ. There's, you know, libraries written on charism. But, but that's what we're talking about. How are we connected? Well, we're connected through that charism, which is the founder. From Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council, to everyone, to each individual, for the good of the church. That's what happened in that cabin a long time ago. And I know the brothers I, that, that were involved in that never thought that anybody was ever going to be given a talk about this in 2013. They saw it as a, as a bridge, as an introduction, as a way to, to get something down on paper because we had nothing down on paper. And to give people a sense of who we are <clears throat> as we, quite frankly, just diminished in number and weren't able to, to keep the schools in the way that we once did. But, you know, that, that's sometimes perceived as just the tragic and sad part of the story. But I don't think it is, because I think what this study kind of illustrated is that all of you get this as well or even better than we do. And, and that's going to benefit the students that we teach. It is the Holy Spirit. But I had to use that word organic for the California crowd. And they're right there. I can see Patty's sitting right there. You know, everything's organic. I couldn't work in Whole Food somehow, but I, I was trying. So that's just an overview, again, of the process. I, I want to say, again, thanks to Cathedral uh, High School in Indianapolis, who were, uh, who were great to me. They were so excited because they were reassociating with Holy Cross. And so they allowed me to do, uh, use them to test the survey that I developed. So the survey was developed off those characteristics. And if you remember, and I wouldn't ask you to, but if you remember when you took it, it pretty much built on each characteristic. And the questions were based on those things. There's, no cert there's certainly no perfect question in any survey, but we were trying to capture. And those survey questions went back to, uh, to use some of Moreau's own language in asking the question. So the process is such uh, that Cathedral was really my first test school, and they were wonderful about it. And they're, they're not included in the final results because they were part of the pilot study. And at that point, they were not yet uh, affiliated again with Holy Cross, but they are now. So there are 15 schools. That's my review of literature. 
I will be having readings of that at one o'clock in, uh, but just to show you where this built, it was, it was built from an organizational model of research, as, you know, so, so culture, which kind of grabbed my attention. Um, I certainly, when Dr. Martin was talking last year about, you know, moving a process forward in, um, you know, planning, that culture, it's all about culture in a way. I mean, I know that's one model that we've developed further past, but um, so my, my basis was culture. And looking at that in our schools, it was the easiest way to capture who we were. I want to say, and I will say a little about the Australian research. Australia, you know, has government-funded public schools, or uh, Catholic schools, and they're allowed to remain Catholic. And so imagine, just, just, just for a moment, now here's the fun part, just imagine what our lives would be like if you had all kinds of money and you could be Catholic. Now get over it, because you don't. So, but they do, and so they spend a lot of time in their central diocesan offices doing research on schools. And, and so if you're looking for stuff, if you're in some sort of program, look to the Australians, because particularly Sydney, they produce great stuff. They've produced a few things on this very question uh, that are critical of what I'm saying today. Critical in the sense that, and you'll see when I talk about the results, where this comes from. The issue of religious orders charisms versus Catholic. And um, I'll use just a quick example because this will grab your attention immediately. The whole idea, when I was at, at, uh, at USF, I was sitting next to a woman um, who was not of the Christian faith. She was Hindu, uh, born in, she was third generation uh, Indian American. And uh, we were talking and I said to her, this, something about this being a Catholic university. And she said, oh no, no, it's a Jesuit university. I'm not making this up. She said, it's a Jesuit university. I said, yes, it is. I said, but that's a religious order of priests and brothers. And she didn't know. How, why would we think she had to know, first of all? You know, um, but she saw the signs, and it's all over that it's a Jesuit university. So we talked about what that meant, and I said, I'm from a, but just, just to keep that in mind. So the, where I'm going with that is, and I'm going to ask the question later, sometimes it's easier for us to be Holy Cross than it is for us to say we're Catholic. We'll get into that. People like Sister Donna and other members of, uh, of Holy Cross Education helped me look at those characteristics just quickly in the beginning to see that they still meant anything to educators. And thankfully they did. I'm not quite sure what I would have done if they said, no, these are nonsense, but they did. Um, the characteristics were, were crafted based, the questions were crafted on those, on those characteristics. And again, thanks to Cathedral. This was basic stuff. And, and if you're thinking about doing a doctorate and you want any advice, please come to see me because I, the point of a doctorate is to get it. Write your opus later. Get your doctorate, get to work. That was a little plug for any religious in the room who are thinking of studying. So I just want to point out too, Holy Cross flushing, the best response. Gianuzzi knew I was coming as president. Yeah, I think he was the only one at that time that knew. Didn't you? You didn't know? Well, all right, so then you just used Joe Giannuzzi as your model for how to do things because it was an 89% return rate. I thought you knew I was coming. All right. I envisioned that he was breaking kneecaps at the baseball bat. Here's the good news. So you took the survey, and I got the results back. And overwhelmingly, you agreed that those characteristics are present in your schools. That was great news. But you don't want it to be perfect because I would have not, not only would I have nothing to talk about right now, but it would have been a very dull defense for my dissertation. So, so all but two of those characteristics, you agreed. Now the agree was just agree. None of you, none, no individual school or the group itself strongly agreed. But that's kind of normal in survey research. But it was very solidly within agree. All of those characteristics except two. And we're going to talk about those two today because I think they're where our challenge lies. So we now agree that, that that content of hope that is the charism of the congregation 
is present in our schools as expressed through the characteristics of a Holy Cross school. So we prove that, and I, I'm deeply appreciative of your taking the survey and helping us to find that out. And this is the transition point, I think, for the Institute and for our relationship of one, to, with one another as a group of schools and as schools sponsored by the congregation. So we've, we've defined ourselves in, in, in a significant way, and we see that through this study. But there are two areas that we need to talk about that there was, um, as the British would say, this was the sexy part of the study, there's uncertainty in two of the characteristics. It was not disagreement. You didn't say these things don't exist in your schools. You said you didn't know. You weren't sure. You couldn't commit to these two characteristics. At least as these questions were asked. No perfect questions, there's no perfect survey in the world. Um, I put that up there again. Please, at Coffee, would you compliment me on that great table? That, that was probably four days worth of work there to get that all lined up. And I'm techie, but this is a pain. The two things are connection to the local church, which I would say in Father Morrow's writings was important to him. It was not a little thing he mentioned. He mentioned it frequently. Our connection to the local church, seeing ourselves as part of the local church, and the second is finding ways to provide educational opportunities to the poor. Those were the two things that we were uncertain about. And you can see the statistics there, which I'll just breeze right past. So our relationship with the local church and our ability, really, desire, ability to provide opportunities for the poor. I don't think either of these things are going to shock anybody in this room, that they are the two hardest parts of what we do as Catholic schools in the Holy Cross tradition. These are big challenges for us. And, but, they're, but they're not insurmountable by any stretch of the imagination, and they're not things that we don't try to do. So I wanted to break this down, the question of the poor, of, of our connection to the local church first. You know, I, cr I created these questions with, with my director, but I took them from the writings of Father Moreau, for the most part. So when you look at um, 19, we're very good about engaging other Catholic institutions, mostly through service, mostly through service of administrators being on board, service of students going there, visiting people that are sick. We do that well, and we see that very much as our connection to the local church. But when we got into questions of, we see ourselves or we see others, because we were being asked the question, so I'm an administrator, so the one question is, do I perceive the teachers as seeing themselves as co-workers with the pastors? Direct quote from Father Moreau. I don't think so. I'm not sure. That's what we're saying. To so just see ourselves as co-workers with the pastors. And you're sitting there already thinking of all the reasons that people would be uncertain about that. I know you. I, I did as the leader of a school. Why would people be so uncertain about that? Is it a language thing? Is it a cult? You know, he was using language, perhaps, that we're not that comfortable with. But to see ourselves as co-workers. But there are other things up there that show a level of uncertainty. I, I want to, you know, I, I think that it's important to remember Father Moreau's vision. Um, he came out of a church very much fractured in the French Revolution that was a rising nationalism within the church, and he was solidly not a nationalist in a sense. He, he threw his lot in with Rome. And so some of his writings reflect that. And, but yet he lives in this tension of being, having been a diocesan priest, and wanting our schools to be connected to the churches. And so I think some of what we're, we're, we're struggling with is his vision, but our context. Um, you know, but he was forward thinking. I think he knew that to be who we are, we had to be connected to the church. We couldn't be off somehow as a, as a different group. I don't, and, and I think we're starting to see a church stir again with a, a leader that has a vision of what the, church, the people of God again. And I think that was very much Father Moreau. But the thought that you couldn't be connected 
to the ecclesial body of the local church. I don't think it ever crossed Father Morrow's mind. And we know everybody's got a bad story in this room. Everybody's got a bad story of a pastor that you've dealt with or a bishop that you've dealt with. And I want to remind you, if you don't know the story, so did Father Moreau. That's Bishop Bouvier's tomb in Le Mans. One of our priests is a bishop of Peoria, Illinois. He taught me when I was a postulant, Dan Jenke. He'd probably shoot me if I ever told this story to a group, but I am. When we were postulants and he told the story of the struggle that Bishop Bouvier gave Father Moreau in the founding of the congregation, Bishop Bouvier trying to control it, trying to keep it local, trying to not let Moreau's vision come to pass. Bishop Jenke said that if you ever go to that cathedral, you were to spit on that grave. I don't think he feels the same way now that he's a bishop, but I'm not sure. So he had a struggle. We've all had that struggle. If you're a president and you go to diocesan meetings, so Joe G and I just went to a diocesan meeting and then we met with some other, other people and we're like, what, what was that about? Like, what, what did we drive two hours through traffic for? But we all have a bad story. You know, I mean, dress like this, you know how many times you get a story? How, you know, when I was nine years old, father said something bad to me. Yeah, me too, you know? And I don't mean to, to downplay the struggle, the real struggles. I just want to say, I was in the Diocese of Scranton in the darkest days. I mean, I can honestly say I saw a bishop get fired by a pope. So I know that this is not easy work. But we're at our best when we are Catholic, first, of, above all things. That is our bishop, Bishop DiMarzio, who is another little character from The Sopranos, but that's another story. But, you know, there, there's nothing more important than that, than when he's there and when we're connected to who we are. And we're lucky. He's easy. He, 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 he's so easy. What he wants is he wants to know that the boys go to Mass, that, that we have confessions in the building, that they have religion class all year. And that's pretty much, at that point, he's, he's happy that he doesn't have to worry about the money of it. He's happy, you know. Some of you have that experience. Some of you have different experiences. A friend of mine gave me this image recently, a diocesan priest who is, was educated at one of our colleges. You know, if you, if you hack off a branch, it could just die. Or you could try to graft it onto another, another tree, another type of tree even, another species of tree. Or you could try and plant it in different soil, but it changes it. And I don't think that's what we want, or I don't think that's what Father Morrow's vision was. It would be easier to just ignore the nonsense in your diocese and in your church. It would be. And, and it's easier. And, you know, that, the, the question, is it easier to be Holy Cross than it is to be Catholic in the United States in 2013? Yes, it is. It's easy because we can make Holy Cross those broad characteristics. And, and again, going back to that, we're a family. People love that. We love it. We just have to be a family. And we can ignore the difficult struggle that exists within the ecclesial structures of this, of this country's church and the world, perhaps. And I'm sure my brothers in France and my brothers in Brazil and my brothers in uh, Chile, this is translatable stuff, but I mean, we're mostly in the context of North America, right, for us. And it would be easier to just say, we're Holy Cross, because, you know, the Holy Cross to, to the laity that works with us are us. And we're not mean. <laughs> And we, we love the people. We, I mean, we have a relationship. We have always had a close relationship with the people that we work with and minister to. And, and they see us, I think, as... Ha I mean, it's the reason that those of us that are religious joined because we saw happy, healthy people in schools. So it's easier to be Holy Cross. But that's not completely what Father Moreau wanted. He, didn't, I, he never had, in his mind, a dichotomy, in my mind, between... Catholic and Holy Cross. It's the same thing. But in marketing, this it's easier. You know, with all those things. And, you know, I had to go to a workshop um, about the new general instruction a few years ago, as we all did. And, I mean, that, those tongue twisters. 
those morning collects that, you know, if you don't have three cups of coffee and study it for half an hour, you're not getting it right. But so this presenter, um, you know, he said, let's just, gentlemen, it's a, a room full of diocesan clergy and a few religious. So you can imagine if there were 68 people in the room, there were 68 ecclesiologies. Every man in that room had a different vision of what the church should be at that particular moment. And he said, gentlemen, let's just get this out of the way. We are not talking about abortion or women's ordination today. And there was a bit of a gasp. And he said, we're talking about the content of the faith. And sometimes we in America get so distracted and so whipped up by real issues, certainly, but also just by the way the media turns it out for us, that we lose that focus, which are the kids right in front of us, too, you know? And their real lives and most of those political issues at that moment in their life are not the same as the American media. Ooh, this is tough. I went through formation at a time where every conversation was about the option for the poor. And I got to tell you, I'm not proud of this, I'm embarrassed by it, but I was sick of it. I was sick of talking about the poor. Peter? Because where did we go with it? We talked about it, we talked about it, we talked about it. Some people were doing it. Some people, particularly in our schools, out of this country, and some even in our country. But, but most of us were in situations where the economic poverty that we were trying to talk about was not present. And it was a frustrating conversation. You know, the University of Notre Dame, which I still think is the greatest thing we've ever done, not the only great thing we've ever done, but the greatest thing we've ever It's $57,000 next year. So we'd be sitting there in the seminary. Uh, I remember going to a, a talk by Gustavo Gutierrez, the liberation theologian, about poverty. And there we are in a, an auditorium at Notre Dame, which the only difference is everything's gilded and gold there. <laughs> and I rather like that. But, you know, so we're sitting in this beautiful auditorium, and, and in comes this little man from Peru. And he says, and most of us, you know, are, are, are eager seminarians in formation. And, you know, and, and, and I was buying that I was going to change the world on this issue with the option for the poor. And we're sitting there, and he said, forget it. None of you are poor. None of you are ever going to be poor. You're already educated. You're white. You're Americans. You're never going to be insignificant, which is what it is to be poor. And there was something that changed in me about this conversation. And it's an important one for us to have now. The presidents are all sitting there thinking, where is he going to go with this? Because i got to look at that budget every day. And I know how hard this is. We try, we try to try to address that fact in this country particularly, except perhaps in the only school that, that probably doesn't struggle with this quite in the way that the rest of our schools do, is Holy Cross of San Antonio. Because it is the growing population in America is Hispanic. We all have Hispanic students in every one of our schools, certainly not in representative number for the American Catholic population. How do we struggle with this question? Well, we've already been refocused in a very simple inaugural homily. If we don't do it, we're not who we are. So I'm back to it again. I got away with 25 years of feeling relatively safe about being upper middle class. And now I've got to struggle with this question again. Thank God, I suppose. Really. It's, it's, it's who we are as a church. Uh, who was it that said, you know, here comes the Catholics, here comes everyone. But if we exclude, even just from our conversation, what an iconic photograph already. Not that other popes haven't done this, but that he has gone out of his way in every occasion, particularly to go to the disabled. You know, do we think of the disabled as poor? Relative to, to a lot of things? I, I just want to give some of my own reflections on why we struggle with this. First of all, there was some variance in the responses. Teachers and administrators and board members answered that question somewhat differently. And it is based on what we all do differently in the context of our schools. If, first of all, administrators are always making everything look good. Right, Kevin? We have to. I mean, come on, we're out there selling the joint, you know? We're not selling a used car, we're selling a brand new car. 
So when administrators answer questions on surveys, they're going to give the best possible response. Absolutely, we try to help the poor. And we do. I mean, they're not lying, but at the same time, that's why that variance is there. Teachers, they're thinking about, who did I see in class today? Who's right before me? Who's poor? Who's poor going to a school that charges $8,600 or $17,000? How do we define poverty? That's that goes back to that question from when I was in formation. Who's poor? I mean, do our Brazilian brothers want to talk to us about who's poor in Brazil and compare that to who's poor in Austin? I mean, you're stopped out on the highway. There's all kinds of homeless people in this town sitting there with signs. Are they poor? Are they poorer than the kids in our school in Chile? I mean, you can't come up with a total litmus test for this. It's not that easy. I wish it were. You know, like the government, here's the poverty line. So only the people below that are poor. It's not that easy. And, and really, when you think about the kids that come into your offices or your classrooms, and they tell you about their family life, even though they live in Silicon Valley, or they live in, uh, you know, uh, Bayside, a lovely section near us, but they're telling you about their family? And how can you not go back to that image of the Pope with somebody that is disabled, maybe perhaps not physically challenged, but the challenge of their daily life? Every one of us has that person, that kid in our schools. Just to show you the variance, again, please, a coffee. Third, Father, the third chart was even better than the others. Just to move on from those two things, uh, just to say a few other things that you said to me in the study with the, with the data that was collected. You said that you wanted a closer and a greater association with the school, with us, with one another as a group. You wanted to learn more. I, did, I found it entertaining, however, that that question about do you want to learn more about Father Moreau, uh, it, was a, it was a weak response. But we've been throwing that at you for a long time, so I don't blame you for kind of saying, all right, all right listen. If I have to listen to that man one more time. So, but you, you clearly think that that's an important part of what you do. But coming together is, I think, the overwhelming desire. You know, I, I'm going to give a little editorial comment here. In the history of our modern congregation in the United States, we were just, in my opinion, as affected by postmodernism and deconstructionism as any other person living in this culture. We became very individual as religious. I think we started to run our institutions that way, that uh, we, were, we were somewhat disconnected from the collective. Um, I adored Stephen Walsh, but he and I would not have agreed on this in the least. We didn't even when I started my study. Stephen, you know, that whole idea, you grow where you planted, and it's all organic, and, and it's all whatever it is in San Antonio is good enough, and whatever it is in Flushing is good enough. And they don't need to, we don't need some common structure. I mean, he and I went back on this constantly in my dissertation, always very respectfully. But, but we didn't have it. But he is a reflection of his generation. I'm a reflection of my generation. And I think the rising generation is saying, we need to have, all right, we're all across schools. What does that mean to us as a group? And how does it, how do we get anything out of that? How do we get anything out of that? by this association, not just coming down here when we're all happy and we all see one another and they're great to us at St. Ed's and I've always loved this place so it's great to come back once a year, but what are we getting out of this association? And that was really the conversation that began me speaking today with Brother Donald. The study, you've said who you are and you're happy with that. We have two issues to struggle with that we're not really surprised by. And those are worthy things for us as a group to, to, to talk about and to struggle with. But where do we go next? How do we stay connected? That's clearly, I think, where we're at. We're on some sort of little precipice here. Um, so where do we go? Well, we're, we celebrate. We, we're great at that. Holy Cross is at a party, isn't it? You know, when I was a young religious first entering, I thought, this is the group I want to be in because we throw a party like nobody else. We get people together. We have a good time. The food's usually good. And, and we talk. We tell stories. I love that. Even last night sitting in the living room at the provincial house, you know, talking about those that have gone before us and people we've lived with. That's so important to who we are. And it's just as important to all of you, particularly those of you that had the benefit of working with the brothers. 
You'll love to tell stories about the brothers. Most of them are appropriate. So to reflect more deeply on those questions, we've got to do it. And, and those are the questions we already are struggling with. You just proved it in your responses. How do you stay Catholic? Each individual Catholic in this country is asking that question. Each individual Catholic is probably asking that question in, in Brazil today. What does it mean to be connected to the institution? Not to the spiritual heritage, not to, to the even pious practices, but to the institution that so often seems to alienate us or we alienate ourselves from. How, how do we struggle with the question of the poor? You know, um, I think sometimes the quick answer to that is our service programs. We are so proud of our service program in Brooklyn and in Queens. You know, and Mike Genovese is, is, uh, is going to retire after 38 years of building this program. That program for that high school is so well known, known in New York City. We have so many partners throughout the city of New York and beyond because of that program. But if that's the only way that we answer that question about the poor, it's cheap. We're not, we're not being really good with the boys in educating the boys to think that the only people that are poor are the people we go out and serve. Uh, I try to say to them all the time in various ways, the, the person sitting next to you is as important and, and as the person out there you're going to go serve is as important as the brothers. So they're not two different groups. We're all that same family. So how do we integrate that in a, in a real way in our schools? And it's an increasing challenge because the budgets are tighter. There's more money than ever. How do, how do we do it? But if we don't struggle with it, we're not in the vision of Father Moreau. That's a, we go to a school in the Bronx, St. Joseph's School for the Deaf. Unbelievable place. It's, it's founded by a religious order of women from France. Um, and it's, it's now no longer a Catholic school because it's directly funded fully by the government, by New York State. And there are 14, I believe, schools in New York State like that. They're either Catholic or Jewish. And they're specialty schools, so they're for the deaf or the... Uh, or, physically challenged or, or other, other types of schools. And so it doesn't, it, but it's still as Catholic as, as any school in, in the best sense of that. And so the reason the picture is taken that way, of course, because every one of those kids is under court protection, not my kids. <laughs> and none of them are on parole or anything. I don't want you to think that's why they weren't. So those are our boys with these kids. And so here are these, you know, I mean, I'm talking about Queens boys, you know. And, and if you haven't been, come to visit. And, and uh, Brother James Brannigan and I talk about the Queens boys all the time. And anybody that's been at that school, they, they'll tell you the truth no matter what. Don't ask them a question that you don't want full disclosure of. Because it'll take your breath away sometimes. But they're, they're just down to, down to earth, working family New Yorkers. And uh, so, but to see these kids, and of course it's an all boys school, you know, 500 of them are involved in athletics, it's a big jock place. It's a lot of machismo on any given day. But on the way to St. Joseph's, which is just across the bridge for us, they're learning a few signs to be able to talk to the kids. I mean, it was just, it's, just, and it, it's absolutely endearing to see this. But the picture I didn't include is one of our kids who graduated last year, Cesar, who's at least my size, uh, dressed up like Super Mario. He's the biggest Super Mario I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, so to, now, you know, here, the poor, here are kids at St. Joseph's School for the Deaf <clears throat> who learn Amer American Sign Language. And that's what they use in school. And they go home and their parents speak Spanish. And even if their parents signed, their parents would sign in Spanish Sign Language, not in American Sign Language. The poor. You have children who cannot communicate with their families, with their parents. I mean, the first, and I'm sitting there with the boys as this is being presented to us. You know, this is important that we go out and serve the poor. But it's not the totality of what I think Father Morrow's vision was about the poor in our schools. I'd like to be so bold that I've spent my couple of years on this in the last perhaps hour talking about it. I think these should become our common understanding of the charism as expressed today. I think we should accept it. And I think this should be the document. Now, I know each school 
has done different types of mission evaluations and other things that are, that are effective and useful. So I'm kind of asking you to think about using this and for us to work in common with using those characteristics as some sort of common mission effectiveness evaluation. And I think it traverses culture. I don't think, in language, I don't think that this is less usable somewhere else, those characteristics, because it is the content, I believe, of who and what Father Moreau wanted us to be. So I used that word common core. I thought I threw that in for the educators. In the room. So I, I want to see the Institute built up. I, I've been saying this for years. A bunch of us have been saying this for years. But, but you know what? You gotta, we got to have a method to do that. I feel a little guilty when I get that letter, as the presidents do, from Brother Donald asking for money. And I don't write out the check. But the answer to that question is, I want to know what I'm getting from, doesn't your board want to know what we're getting for our money? This is a great event. It's been going on, we're, we're coming on, this is eight years, I think, that this, is, this gathering's been going on. We're going to approach 10 years. I'd like to see by 10 years that there's a strategic plan that allows them to raise the money that they need to raise. Because it's not going to go to the next level without money. Because you need people, and we need to, we're going to benefit from this. But I think unless we come up with some real plan, hardcore, like we have to do in our own schools to raise money plan, um, the Institute is so sponsored by the, by the university, but let's face it, it's not St. Ed's is the only benefactor of this. It, it's all of us. But if we don't grab onto something concrete, and we just keep talking about this, I'll come back in a few years and we'll still be talking about it. That was pretty, I don't think they actually invited me to do that, but I just did it anyway. Um, we, all, we all think that, I think, we believe that something for our new faculty that's a common experience. Faculty administrators, other Catholic uh, religious orders have done this where we bring people together and they spend time specifically being enculturated into who we are. And the characteristics are an easy framework for that. You can hand them Christian education and ask them to, and hope they read it. And you can give them sections of the circular letters or the great material that Brother Joel has developed over the years on the expression of the spirituality. But we need some common conversation. I think we want something in common. I could be wrong about all that. So, and I'll go back to flushing tomorrow. So. But I think we want something in common. I think the generation that's rising wants more of a connection to some central and internal structure. Different than my generation did, certainly different than Brother Stephen's generation did, but that's where we're at today. And we're talking about passing this tradition on. So we have to provide some framework for that. It can't be just any longer what we have always been taught as Holy Cross religious, that we're mostly an oral tradition. That was true in many ways, but I mean, for God's sake, we're approaching 200 years. We're no longer just an oral tradition. There, there are, if we were an oral tradition, Brother Joel would be out of work. He's written volumes on this, as we have other men and other women of Holy Cross. There's, there's all kinds of ways to do this. Now go home and take up again that work of resurrection. And be strengthened by what we have in common. Thank you.